Let me turn your attention to verses 12 to 20 in Galatians chapter 4. A remarkable passage. And I want to bring it to you as such. What we have here is Paul's passionate appeal. The apostle gets a lot of bad press as being a really tough guy. But when you read these verses, you'll see that he has a heart of flesh and a great love for God's people. And when I read them and studied them, I couldn't help but thinking these words are right up to date. The reason for the apostles' words are his concern for the people of God. And in a day and an age when individualism has become the norm, these words are surely a deep challenge to me and to you. Do I have this kind of compassion for and passion for the community of God's people called the church? I've written here at the beginning, are you following Christ or following people? Are you following Christ or following people? And then I've written, what kind of an ist are you? I-S-T. You could be a Buddhist. You could be a Taoist. Wow, I've got that one out. You could be a Confucianist. You could come inside Christianity. You could be a Methodist, a Baptist, Congregationalist. And sadly what happens is when you get into the Christian spectrum, there's a tendency amongst us to give primary allegiance to our ist and not to Christ. What I found really quite intriguing is Jesus' name ends with I-S-T. And the name of his people is Christ's ones, Christians. And as I read this passage, and hopefully it brings it home to you, we need to recognize again God's great priority for his people, to be his people, to live as his people, and to enjoy the benefits of being his people. Paul goes through three different spheres in these verses before us. He reminds us, first of all, that Christ's people are friends. He reminds us, tragically, that they can become foes. And then he brings out a beautiful appeal to remind us that we're family. Let's look at this passage under those headings this morning. Let's just consider with the apostle what it means to be a Christian. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. And then these beautiful words, you have not injured me at all. And there's been some strange things done. So great is this idea of friendship. The bond that's between believers is something which is to be looked for, to be developed, to be anticipated. Because when people become Christians, the gospel unites them as brothers and sisters without borders. It doesn't matter where you're born in the world. If you're one of Christ's people, you're one of Christ's people. You're immediately brought into a group of friends. Folks who have had similar experience to you and have the same hope and confidence. All barriers of cultural and religious distinctions should have disappeared. And that, dear friend, is the problem, isn't it? Paul needs to speak quite straight to these people and remind them 
of this great link that there is between them. And, and, and he keeps on bringing up in his letters time after time. Look back to chapter 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is, please notice the present tense, neither male nor female, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the principle he's working on, and that's the principle that this passage challenges us to embrace and, and put into practice. It's the model for Christ's church, universal. And therefore, it's the goal of every local congregation that we should be each other's friends because we are indeed, as I'll show you, if I have time before I'm finished, that we're family. That we've come to know the friend who sticks closer than a brother. And then you should not be surprised that that's the very thing that the enemy attacks continually. And that's why there are so many ists. There are usually historical reasons for them. But they can become an end in themselves. And it's a very subtle shift. But it ends up in a fracturing of the people of God. Which is contrary to what the New Testament teaches. Paul continually needs to remind his audience. That we are new people. A new people of God. Looking for a the new world. Listen in Colossians chapter 3 verse 10. He says you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Or as he writes to the Corinthians Chapter 12 and verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And have all been made to drink of one spirit. The apostle is dealing with a situation where people are trying to fragment that truth. They're trying to draw off some of the Christians just to be their own little clique. Verse 12, brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. Paul himself is living evidence that the barriers have been broken down. Once a zealous Jew who thought there was no higher calling in the world than to exterminate Christianity. And God literally stopped him in his tracks. At noon, he met the Lord Jesus shining brighter than the sun. And the Lord Jesus' words are important. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Because we are the body of Christ as they were. No matter which country we're born in, which culture we belong to, what colour our skin is, there is only one human race. Paul is living evidence of the beautiful fulfilment of the power of God's promises to take unbelievers and bind them to believers. I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. Once, as I said, a zealous Jew, listen to him speaking. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. 
though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he might have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Yet indeed, verse 8 of that chapter says, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Such is the transformation that took place in that man's life. And such is the transformation that takes place in your life and mine. It matters not at all what our background is. What matters is where we are in Christ, adopted children, forgiven sinners, joined together through the hope of the cross. Paul has turned to live like a Gentile. And he's been out preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He's all things to all men that he might by all means save some. And such is the priority of this apostle that he no longer goes about saying, you know, God has a special role for Israel and you must join Israel. No, he says quite clearly, what you need to do is come to Christ and in coming to Christ, you become part of his church, part of his body. He speaks here of how much care they had for him and even the way that they cared for him, the rapport that there had been between them as friends. Verse 13, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Think about the picture. If you open up Bible commentaries, there is usually at least two pages discussing what was Paul's infirmity. It's really annoying because he doesn't tell us. But we know it was something about his eyes. Some suggest malaria because that part of the world had many mosquitoes. Other people point to the fact that he was stoned and left it for dead at Derby, wasn't it? And perhaps his eyes were injured. It's not important. What is important is the bond of fellowship and friendship that these people had. Because this once zealous Jew came telling them the wonderful gospel of the great God in heaven. Who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten. And he gave him so that men and women might not perish and they don't perish through believing. Not through being a Jew, not through being a Gentile, not through being rich, not through being poor, not through self-sacrifice. Believing. So simple, it's almost embarrassing. Notice how he describes his visit. In the providence of God, Paul had an affliction, which meant he had to stay in the region of Galatia. Perhaps he hadn't planned to do that. But the result of it was that when he was found, he began to preach the gospel. I preached the gospel to you. And what did they hear? They didn't just hear a clever ex-Jew expounding the wonders of what following Christ was like. No, they heard Jesus speaking. It's a, a beautiful passage and quite a, an encouragement to any preacher. Now, while you hear my voice with your natural ear, it is possible at the same time to hear God speaking to you through his word. And for that reason, he's an angel of God, a messenger of God. 
No, he's even more. He's even Christ Jesus. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear without a preacher? It's a, it's a humbling perspective. But the fact is that God chooses to speak to people, to bring the gospel to their attention through frail human beings like themselves. And when that happened, there was a power in their life. A bond was created so strong that his physical condition didn't put them off. In fact, the very opposite happened. They said, what can we do to help? You would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me. You just think how precious your eyes are. How much would you be willing to be paid for one of your eyeballs? Yeah, you could manage without one. But he doesn't say one, does he? He says eyeballs, eyes. How much would you be willing to be... To, to sacrifice your ability to see. Well, that's a, 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 an insight into the, the, the depth of the bond that had taken place in this area of Galatia. He's describing events that are in Acts chapter 13 and 14. We're told that when he went to Pisidian Antioch, it says in chapter 13, verse 42, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. That was the effect on it. He had gone to the synagogue and the Jews were having none of it. But the Gentiles wanted more. And then later on in that same chapter, it's worth a read. It's one of Paul's, one of the few of Paul's written sermons. It says at the end, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. Not Paul. Their bond, their unity, their delight is in the word of the Lord. And you have that lovely little phrase at the end of that verse. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. This is how God works. He brings the word of God to people. And when people hear the word of God, they are hearing Jesus speak. Just Paul's idea? No. The Lord Jesus says in Matthew 10, 40, He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. To hear the word of God and to be, believe it is to receive God. To receive Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20 the apostle speaks. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. And that's what the unbeliever needs to hear the preacher saying. Don't become my follower. I'm not building any kind of ist. I don't want you to join my church. What I want you to do is to come to Christ. Become of one of his followers. Become known as such. And to go on as such. Christian, let this passage stretch your mind and heart. To, to realize that. Every Christian is your brother and sister. Now some of us are really eccentric people and we're a bit odd at times. But I'm still your brother or sister. No, I can't be your sister. But you know what I mean. And the Lord puts us together, eccentric as we can be, for a reason. To, to, to rub the edges off each other. So that we become a real living body of people who are friends with each other, who take time with each other, who are interested in each other, who are living and working for the welfare of each other. It involves self-sacrifice. It means embracing a higher plan than your own goal for life. 
It means understanding why God has saved you and kept you here to advertise his grace and mercy to the world around us. But tragically, history has shown us how people seek their own preferences. And so the world is full of ists. I hope that phrase is beginning to annoy you like it's annoying me, but it's a point that needs to be taken home. A visitor to a mental hospital was astonished, it says, to note that there were only three guards watching over a hundred dangerous inmates. And so he said, don't you fear that these people will overpower the guards and escape? No, was the reply. Lunatics never unite. And when you look at Christianity, we find that's the case. Lunatics never unite. And there's a lunacy about Christianity, friends, which you and I need to recognize and need to prayerfully abandon. Because we are one body. If you fell over on your way home on a slippy pavement and twisted your wrist, the rest of your body might just decide to keep you awake all night in sympathy. That's us, the body of Christ. That's what Jesus is doing, building that kind of a church, a universal company of people from every tribe and tongue and nation who will be for the glory of God. And that's a beautiful picture. And then it's a, a shock to realize that somebody was driving a wedge in. Run your eye down to verse 16. Have I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous and a good thing always, and not only when I'm present with you. Their relationship together has been undermined by men. Ultimately Satan, but Satan uses men and women. And he's driven that wedge. Clever salesmen have come and they've used persuasive speech. And they've argued their case so that you can hardly find a way to get round it. And the reason is to make you their customer. The reason is to make you their clique. And this is what Paul is writing about. And this is why he's doing what he's doing in this book. He's, he's saying some really tough things. And I thought this morning as I, I was praying, praying about preaching this, Lord, keep me from being judgmental and overcritical, but help me to communicate the fact that we're always in danger. Of being split off into people's cliques. Their ists. And remember then that Satan's an expert in all the things of God. He knows theology better than any theologian alive today. And then remember that he's not interested in the unbelievers. His, his goal is to, to, to thwart Jesus' business of building his church. And if he can't stop it, one of the things he will do is, is, is get it involved in infighting. It therefore becomes us to make sure what's important to us is the same as what's important to God. That we are indeed one body in Christ Jesus. Christ Church if you look back across the pages of history, has been blown apart by misplaced zeal. One of the comments I saw was that in the United States there are 2,000 plus denominations. And a great deal of them thinking and saying they're the only ones that are right. That's the enemy. I need to bring this to your attention as I do to myself to say that God doesn't care about your pet ideas 
and your private idiosyncrasies. What God cares about is whether, in fact, you and I are a living church as we are appointed to be. And that we are always on the, on the guard against those wolves who will come in sheep's clothing. They will never be unpleasant. They will always be attractive. They will seek to undermine the gospel. Again, that's really the theme of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And then down at verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? There is only one name for God's people. And that's Christian. Every other name is an introduction by human beings. Every other allegiance is to fly in the face of the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember how he prays in John 17, verse 23, I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you loved me. Paul's love for these people hasn't shifted one little bit. That's a reassurance in verse 12. You've not injured me at all. How many splits and divisions have been caused by somebody who got their toes trod on? Paul says, no, I don't have a problem with you. I have a problem with what you're doing. And so Paul speaks to them with a passion and compassion that only comes from a pastor or a man who's been appointed by God. I've got written here chapter 5 and verse 4. It says there, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. That's his concern. He wants them to know and enjoy the benefits of the Christian gospel. It's really the difference between Biblical Christianity and religion. 1 Corinthians 10, 19, I think it is, tells us it's a test. Divisions must come that you who are approved might be made manifest. These differences are brought in by the enemy. You remember his audacity. He took the Lord Jesus up onto the high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, just worship me and they're yours. Dear friends, my observation is there are many who are kingdom building. And a passage like this really, really comes home to us. Therefore, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth, because I speak the truth in love? And as I studied this, I thought, you and I need, you and I need to be shaken a, a good deal by this, this passage because there is a tendency amongst us to at least subconsciously think my group is the right group. And not to be humble enough to recognize that you might be wrong. You see, there's only one thing a Christian should be passionate about, and that's the gospel. That's what verse 18 is about. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I'm with you. You see, they had been thrilled by the gospel when the apostle was with them. And now he's saying, you need to be passionate about one thing, the gospel, and be on the lookout for those who are passionate about their own kingdom building. They had experienced the gospel. They had felt it. They had enjoyed it. Notice again in verse 15, what then was the blessing you enjoyed? Paul could testify to what he has seen with his own eyes and what's recorded in Acts 13, that when they came to Christ, they were in fact 
the happiest people on earth, and so they should be. Their sins are forgiven. They're reconciled to God. They have an eternal inheritance in Christ. Isn't it tragic how that becomes familiar when some people just come alongside and they whisper in your ear, yeah, you're right, the gospel is important. And as I've studied this, I'm more and more convinced that splintering Christianity surely grieves God. That passage from Second Peter, the judgment begins at the house of the Lord. It, it, is it possible that one of the reasons for our present calamity in this virus is that Christianity has, has lost its bearings? And people are more concerned for their historical grouping than they are for being Christians. Look around you. It's not just in the past, it's happening now. I thank God for what's happening in Scarborough, but I tremble when I read that their business is to establish more Anglican churches. Why? You can't find an Anglican church in the Bible. What is it that gets into people who think my goal in life is to build up this, this aspect? It's not only there, it's right here in Pickering. In the years we've been here, we've seen new groups pop up, haven't we? Welcome church. We're pontificating that we don't even have the Holy Spirit here. What arrogance. What contradiction. And dear friends, these are only two. I told you I was trembling about mentioning anybody. I can keep going. We had a couple join us, became members, who, who, who called themselves Bible Baptists. What on earth is that? Why on earth does anybody describe themselves like that? Their attempts to take over were futile. And so eventually what they do is they go and set up in competition next door. Is that the kind of honor that Christ should have according to the apostles? Every true Christian should be seeking out a community where the gospel is, is, is central and becoming part of it and encouraging it. And that is going to be the challenge for the years ahead. That, dear friends, will be the watershed of real Christianity. What's my priority? Preaching Christ and getting people to faith in Christ or building what I think Christianity should look like. Paul says these people have come in. I was encouraged to read these words from Mr. Spurgeon. A plague upon denominationalism. There should be but one denomination. We should be denominated by the name of Christ, as the wife is named by her husband's name. As long as the church of Christ has to say, my right arm is Episcopalian, my left arm is Wesleyan, my right foot is Baptist, and my left foot is Presbyterian or Congregational, she is not ready for the marriage. She will be ready when she has washed out these stains, when all her members have one Lord one faith and one baptism. Perhaps what's happening in our present calamity is the Lord is really saying to us, isn't it time that you all came together, Bible-believing Christians under the umbrella of Christ and not under the umbrella of anybody? And I've got here a word for the unbeliever, you see. Which church should you go to? The one that preaches Christ crucified and calls men and women to repentance and faith and then to live a life of holiness. I do not want you to join my church because I do not have a church. It's his. I'm simply a caretaker. I'm simply a worker. And I find in, in modern Christianity, and oh man, time's beating me, but let me go. That, that there's a, a subtle tendency which really challenges me. 
the, the, the change in the way that the, the leaders of churches are described, they're now inevitably called pastors. Now, when you call somebody a pastor, that means they're in control, they're in charge. Because that's what the word comes from the word shepherd, and the shepherd was in charge of the sheep. The New Testament only ever uses that word once. And it doesn't use it in isolation. It calls him a pastor and teacher. The preferred name for a Christian leader in the New Testament is elder, recognizing the maturity, or minister, servant. And I think one of the troubles with modern Christianity is there's too many people who think I'm a pastor. And that, tragically, there's too many sheep who think, yeah, I actively resist using that word to describe myself. I wouldn't dare. This is his church. And I'm his servant. So, dear friend, if you're not a Christian, I don't want you to join my church. I want you as part of Christ's church. I want you to turn to him. Trust him. Believe on him. Live for him. Let me go to my final point. My clock says I've got five minutes left. They were family. There is in the last two verses of this section, one of the most beautiful revelations of the heart of the apostle in the whole of the Bible. Listen to him speak. My little children. For whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone. For I have doubts about you. I'm worried. The word doubts is a bad translation. The, the, the word actually means I'm puzzled, I'm confused. I don't understand why. What would the apostle say to modern Christianity? You and I need to take note of this incredible description of Paul's heart. And you and I need to ask ourselves whether you have that kind of a heart for the church of Christ. And that that kind of heart means the church is more important than your est or anybody's ists. He'd watched them being born again. And the language here describes him longing for them to be mature and grown up. So that in effect that they would be sanctified by his spirit. And he's deeply troubled because he's quite clearly not in Galatia. He's somewhere else and can't be with them. So he's, he's expressing his deepest, deepest compassion. Because the church of Christ is the most significant body on the whole of the planet. And all together from every ist and every nation, we will be the bride of Christ. There's a little story about Mr. Wesley he dreamt he'd arrived in, in heaven. Or at the gates of heaven. And he, 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 when he was standing there he says. Are there any Baptists in there? Are there any Methodists in there? Are there any Congregationalists in there? And the story goes on. It's too long to repeat it all. And the reply. No there's only Christians. There's only Christians. And I plead with you. And with anybody else who might hear this. That you would recognize there's only Christians. And as Christians we are one body. In Christ Jesus. And we need to recognize we are family. And that that's the difference between Christianity and religion. We've not adopted a set of rules. My standing with God doesn't matter whether I was dipped in water or had water dropped on my head. It doesn't matter whether I've got a community of elders joined across churches or just a local independent church. It doesn't matter. Time prohibits me, I could go on. 
What does matter, dear friends, is that we are one body in Christ and we need to be compassionate. Well, why am I talking like this? I'm, I'm telling myself to shut up. But you see, this is my calling under God. Paul says to the Ephesian elders, 20, Acts 20, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to the flock of God, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You notice the church of God. We entrusted with it. And when you come to a passage like this, you have to be honest with it and have to lay it out in front of people. I need to stop. But notice that little phrase, my little children. This is the only time in the whole New Testament Paul uses it. And it indicates to us how much he felt for those people. The Apostle John uses it all the time. But this is the only time that Paul uses it. Because he wants them to understand his heart is for the work of Christ. There shouldn't be any Paulists in the world. There should only be Christians. He longs, you see, to see them growing and going on with God. Because they're family. Think about it. You do that with your own children, don't you? You've done it with your own children. They were all different, but you had the common goal for them to grow up and be mature. And even now you're delighted in how that continues. If it does continue, and it doesn't always. That's the apostle's heart for the church of Christ. And I feel that it's time to say to the church of God, grow up. Dump all these man-made tanks. Be the body of Christ for your generation. There was a man walking down the street, I've got written here, and he passed a, a used bookstore. And in the window he saw a book and the title caught his attention. It was How to Hug. So he went inside and he, he wanted to buy the book and he was given the book to look at. And then to his annoyance, he found it was only the seventh volume of an encyclopedia. With how to hug within its pages. The church is a place where when coronavirus is not around, we need to know how to hug. I'm not a hugger, but we shake hands. We show deference, we encourage community, we, we desire to, to grow up and whoever comes through the doors is welcome. Our first question is not what is do you belong to? But do you know Christ as your Lord and Saviour? And that would be my final question to any unbeliever here today. Let me just bang the drum again. It's vitally important. That you escape all the confusion of the ists and come to Christ. Trust him. He's the only saviour. And his church is the only church. And when you belong to it, it's one of the greatest privileges on earth. We've been reading Paul's passion for the church. I pray that God would give me a passion like it. When George Whitfield was preaching in Philadelphia courthouse to thousands, he cried out, Father Abraham, whom have you in heaven? Any Episcopalians? No. Have any of you any independents or seceders? No. Have you any Methodists? No, no, no. Whom have you there? We don't know those names here. All who are here are Christians, believers in Christ, men and women who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of testimony. Oh, in this case, he said, then God help me, God help us all to forget party names and to become Christians in deed and in truth. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you know, I didn't want to speak these words, but you gave them to me. I'm not blaming you, Lord. I'm praying for the 
good effect of them. With this modern media going out through the world, who knows who will listen to them? I pray earnestly, most holy one, that you might convict us all afresh, that we're brothers and sisters together, and it's time we dump these party titles for Jesus' sake. Amen. Six hundred and fifty-one. Jesus, your boundless love to me, no thought can reach, no tongue declare. O oh, knit my thankful heart to thee, and reign without a rival there. Thine holy, thine alone I am, be thou alone my constant flame. Six, five, one. for your great love and your incredible patience. Help us to know how to live as Christ's and to show him to the world and to call men and women to repentance and faith in him for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs> 